Join me for a conversation with the founder of Cobalt Press. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. This is the podcast where we learn how to become better game masters and role players by filling ourselves with stories and knowledge. Okay, guys, I have a fantastic interview today. Here it is. My guest today is a writer and game designer. He is also the founder of Cobalt Press, Wolfgang Bauer. Wolfgang, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. No, absolutely. It is my pleasure. How did you discover tabletop role-playing games? Oh, I was primed for them by fiction. I had been reading The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings in middle school, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah, middle school. And I thought those were great and, and fantasy novels of all kinds. And then I walked into my local hobby store um, and discovered uh, there was a blue box with a dragon on it, a big red dragon and a wizard and some sort of warrior guy. And I'm like, well, I want that. That looks like a fantasy book, but it's in a game box. And I couldn't afford it. So I had to wait like for Christmas or a birthday. I don't remember exactly. For me, it was a while ago, but I got the blue box uh, as a gift and I convinced the neighbor kids to play and I I strung armed my little sister into plan too, and uh, <laughs> it was, that was all she wrote. I was like, "Yay, this is the best!" Nice. Um, funny dice and all, little little blue box put me on the path to hey RPGs rule. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And now I guess since you got the uh, box there, you had to become the dungeon master right off, right? I did, although at the time I didn't realize what I was getting into exactly. <laughs> Like when I told my friends about it at school, they're like, oh, well, you're going to do that game with us, too. Not just, you know, your sister, or the neighbors, whatever. And I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, come on, we'll have a game. And the school librarian was very tolerant. And we uh, we played the dungeon board game a little bit because that was like D&D. &D. Um, but it was it was me running that show and making stuff up because as I quickly discovered, there was sort of a bottomless appetite for adventures and stories and uh, all sorts of crazy characters in those early days. I barely understood what I was doing, so it was learned by doing <laughs> very much. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, um, I started playing when I was nine, and I did not play by the rules until, I think, like 2014. <laughs> so don't Right? Worry about it. <laughs> I think I started at 11, and I was pretty fast and loose with stuff for a while. Um, but, you know, it was early days. Everyone was sort of making yeah. it up That's yeah you're just doing your own thing so you think uh your your love of fiction then just drew you in because you got to like be the hero or the character yeah. or make up the game world yeah you totally got to be the hero right that yeah. drew me in story was a big part of it world building was a big part of it um i got to make up my own world right and uh, because mm -hmm. there wasn't really much in the way of published settings in the 80s there was some there was greyhawk kind mm -hmm. of if you knew what you were doing um but you know the forgotten realms were still a glimmer in mr greenwood's eye at that point it it, it didn't exist mm -hmm. um so and dragonlance was not a thing for me at first um but then in later years of course i got to work uh at tsr on second edition D D, and uh and later at wizards of the coast so yeah i got yeah. pretty close to the to where that stuff happens as a designer. But when I was just a, a kid, not even a teenager, mm -hmm. I was just wallowing in. It's like the Hobbit, but I get to roll some dice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And of course, we will touch on TSR and Wizards of the Coast here in a bit, I'm sure. But um, sure. game design or writing for TSR or Wizards of the Coast, I don't think that was your first uh, plan, was it? Oh, no, 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 no. That was not the plan. Uh, gaming was for fun. Tabletop games, all for fun. Um, and I don't think I realized that, you know, you could work in it professionally right away. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, Dragon Magazine and Dungeon Magazine were things I picked up at the local hobby store and then eventually got subscriptions to. So it's like, well, clearly someone's working on this stuff month <laughs> after month. Some artist is painting this cool cover or or mapping out these cool dungeons. But um, But it wasn't like a career aspiration, except in the sense that, you know, Surely someone in Wisconsin is is doing this. But I was more interested at the time in pursuing a career in chemistry. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I actually went to university, got my bachelor's degree as a chemist, a biochemist, and uh, and stuck with that thinking, I can write this stuff on the side. Um, <laughs> because by then I had published a few things uh, in magazines and... Um, Iron Crown Enterprises asked me to write a thing called like the Treasury of Middle Earth, oh. uh, compiling all the magic items of Middle Earth and the Lord of the Rings into one volume. Um, wow. That made me realize that writing game design was work. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. because there was no story in it. It was a catalog yeah. and a compendium, right? So it's like copy paste, copy paste from all these sources or retype from sources because there was no digital equivalent Mm -hmm. and then send them these huge tables and descriptions and all this stuff. Like they sent me the entire iron crown enterprises back catalog and said, just go through every single one of the books we've mailed you in this enormous crate, find all the magic items and organize them into a book. That's just magic items, (laughs) which, you know, I could see the utility of that. I wanted a book like that, but for D and D, uh, I wasn't actually playing Middle Earth role playing at the time, but I, you know, it was my first gig with a book that would be a separate book, not a magazine article. So I was like, whatever, I can figure this out and applied myself to the rule set. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess a couple questions. What, what did it feel like to work on Lord of the Rings after being such a fan? Uh, it felt great, but I immediately got that sense of, I don't think the RPG is entirely faithful to Professor Tolkien's vision. Like, I think there, there oh, are no. magic items in the Lord of the Rings role playing game, at least the Middle Earth role playing version. I'm like, this doesn't feel like a Lord of the Rings item, right? But it had to have mechanics and modifiers and damage types and descriptions and pricing and you know, rarity. And like, all of that took me out of the sense that it was part of the world building that was all narrative and character driven and story driven. So I realized I didn't really want to work on a magic item encyclopedia again. I wanted to write more adventures mm-hmm. uh, or do world building. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's interesting too, because um, you know, the the idea i think you know of the story when that captures us when we're just making a catalog i can see the difference there and of course right? um and of course they were having to compete with the uh the giant or the uh the yeah. uh, the troll in the room which was <laughs> dungeon of dragon so they're probably right? changing I the mean, feel a bit uh, it's kind of like the yeah. late 80s period and Yeah, people who had played D&D would come and say, oh, my gosh, Lord of the Rings. Well, I want to play that. And the lore master system was even more involved uh, that Middle Earth role playing was built on. So, yeah, it was a very fiddly system. And I don't think they're in business anymore. The the license for Lord of the Rings has gone on to several other firms since then Mm -hmm. who maybe have taken a different approach to the rule set. I don't want to. I want to say I didn't find it appealing, right? Like the idea of a encyclopedia of magic items is still appealing to me today. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really useful at the game table, but it's kind of where I first saw the split between, well, heroic fantasy as narrative and heroic fantasy as game experience. Um, Cause they're two totally different animals sometimes. Yeah. 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 I still remember those books. I I never played it, but um, I think I did. I think I got it somewhere over here. I grabbed it. They had the, was it uh, John Howe or Alan Lee's uh, uh, Eowyn facing the uh, Witch King on the cover? I I bought that. Right. 
it, right? And I didn't I mean, know that what cover. it was. How could yeah? I'd be like, I know, gotta I, have I, it. I didn't even know what it was, you know. And I was like, <laughs> oh, how do I play this or whatever? And it was like, no way. But I just bought it because that cover is amazing. Right. You know? Yeah. I that... I think I mean sometimes it's the story that draws us into fantasy mm-hmm. uh, and, and tabletop games, and sometimes it's it's something else. Like our friends say, "Hey, I got this cool game. Let's play." Right. Yeah. Uh, it's it's just a social occasion, um, and and sometimes it's it's a whole another level of performance, right? Like you see, streaming games these days. Where I, I mean, I only wish I'd had that level of play at age twelve, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, no kidding, no kidding. Yeah, there's well, there's so much there's so much stuff nowadays. You know, I um uh. I don't know. Well, like you can just watch a YouTube video and learn how to play where I was. Which is great. Yeah, I know. And me in 1987, looking at the rules, I was just like, okay, I'm going to make it up (laughs) and we're just going to go or whatever. Right. (laughs) I mean, I still do this with board games. Like I'll open a new board game and I'll, I'll bring it to a whatever Labor Day party and say, okay, let's play it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, do we want to read the rules or do we just want to fake it once and see how we do? (laughs) And it's interesting, right? Like some people are just like, no, we must read the rules and understand them first. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, it'll be half an hour before we get to play. And other groups, you sort of plop it down and they're like, I'll punch out the counters. I'm going to put this board over here. Do you want to be green? Let's go. Mm -hmm. Um. And I think you see this in RPG groups, too, where some oh, people yeah. are like, if I can figure out how to make a character, if you just provide me with a character sheet, I'll go, right? Like yeah. convention games, you pretty much have to do that. There's no time yeah. to do all that setup. But especially if it's your campaign and you're trying real hard to do world building and establish a narrative and your friends are counting on you to do like something that they want to play and you've talked about what that is. Um, you know, you'll spend some more time on prep. I often spent more time on prep than I did playing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I did when I was younger and then I've moved into the no prep kind of camp. I even wrote a yes. book about it because, um, you know, when I was 17, I could sit there and watch, you know, Star Trek The Next Generation and plan, you know, how to get a campaign, but I can't do that anymore, you know. Um, I, I am, think no prep games are amazing. They are. I, I think they are absolutely as well. Why would you think they're amazing? Well, I think they're amazing partly because I, like you, no longer have that time, right, mm-hmm. to to devote to it. Much as I enjoy prep and sort of daydreaming about how it could go, sure. the reality is, oh, my God, they're coming over on Saturday night and I haven't prepped anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I like about some no prep games is um, they lean heavily on improv, mm-hmm. which I feel like I learned the hard way just by being underprepared no matter what or having <laughs> having players who it was fun to riff off of right uh-huh. um and because because taking you know three index cards and some prompts from your players is often a, a fantastic one shot or even a whole campaign mm-hmm. um that they feel more invested in right like the no prep games i like to do i you know i i prefer to say something like okay it's call of cthulhu it's 1930s shanghai tell me what you want out of this game do you want to be with the gangsters the communists or the nationalists right and (laughs) and if the players say oh we want to all be gangsters i'm like great and then i have to tell a gangster story off the cuff but the more i ask and it's really about sort of enabling players and those kind of improv games Mm -hmm. Um, the more I ask, you know, do you want to be low-level gangsters or gangster kingpins? Do you want to be involved in drug running, guns, you know? Um, and we kind of build it together. It feels like a world-building exercise almost mm-hmm. as much as a story-building exercise. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, 
I think those, you know, you'll hear people say, well, of course, I experienced it two years ago. It's just like, oh, my players aren't very engaged in my campaign. Or I had this, you know, this underworld of of water deep kind of campaign going on and they they want to go and wander the forest or whatever. Um, well, that's right. all eliminated. You know, yeah, that's all eliminated if you just say, hey, guys, what do you want to do? What do you what do you want to do in this game? Right. Do you want to be super heroic or do you want to be gritty? getting by the skin of their teeth rogues or like if you throw out two or three options, Mm -hmm. usually they'll pick one of them. Yeah. Uh, But some of the best games I've been in, have been like, no, we want to be guarding a merchant caravan across the desert. And I'm like, Oh, okay. That wasn't on my radar at all, but, (laughs) (laughs) but I think I can make that work. Yeah. Fairly linear. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, of course, there are some game masters or dungeon masters out there who are, who are like freaking out and say, well, I wouldn't know what to do. Uh, what, what do you, what would your response be to that? If they say merchant caravan and desert, what's your response? Oh, sure. Well, I mean, don't go into an improv, no prep game if that's not your <laughs> comfort zone, right? Mm-hmm. I, I have to say, I like those games, but I don't always run them, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I often say we're living in the golden age of yeah. prepared materials, right? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And if I want to go out and say, um, oh, I don't know, I want to play Horde of the Dragon Queen to, or my Lost Minds of Fandelver or whatever it is, I'm just going to take an off the shelf D&D product, Cthulhu product, uh, you know, pick your system. And I'm just going to run that. Well, it's taken a huge burden off me, right? Mm-hmm. And if my players say, no, but no, we really want the Desert Caravan, I'll be like, well, okay. Um, but I I don't feel as comfortable doing improv and riffing. So you guys got to wait till next week till we play. I'm going to research this. I'm going to do whatever I need to feel comfortable. Because mm-hmm. to be honest, when I was starting out as a DM, I felt like there was one true way to play. There was one way to interpret the rules, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't like big old rules lawyering discussions, but I felt like freewheeling chaotic fun, which at least one of my players always enjoyed, right? Like the, Mm -hmm. the Wahoo, I'm just here for, for the lulls kind of player. Mm -hmm. Um, I felt like that was not what we were here for. We're here to play a serious game and tell a serious story in a very particular way. I was very formal in how I wanted to run as a game master. Right. Yeah. And I don't think everybody is, but I think especially newer game masters, Mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with saying, I'm going to run this kind of by the book because I don't want to do freewheeling improv that leads us into, you know, weird dark corners of water deep when, the adventure is set out in the wilds, right? Like mm-hmm. stick with published materials. They'll usually steer you right. They've got beautiful maps, great characters. The monsters are there. Uh, the milestones are there. The story beats are there. You still got to bring plenty of your own creativity, improvisation, answering player questions that aren't covered in the material. Um, every time I do low prep or improv kind of games it feels like a high wire act a little bit Mm -hmm. um because sometimes somebody asks the question that i really don't know and i'm like you know i'm gonna go get a coke in the kitchen i'll be right back (laughs) of course that's that's the secret (laughs) right i need to give away all the secrets yeah (laughs) right i need 30 seconds to think about it because i'm like what huh (laughs) okay i maybe like not everybody there's a certain pressure that comes with less preparation Mm -hmm. and it can be really empowering and freeing to say, we're just going to do it together. And if we don't know the answer, we'll we'll take a little break, but, Mm -hmm. um, but having structure and having resources and assets and like, there are tokens for this monster prepared, or I have 3d printed this terrain for you, dear players Mm -hmm. plonk. Cause I am so prepared. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's hard to argue, right, with the pure joy of, oh my gosh, our game master is so prepared. He's got little train cars for horror on the Orient Express, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Those yeah. games that are heavily prepped are often super memorable. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, no, I agree. I agree. And um, I, you know, even though I said, you know, I wrote a little book called the no prep game master, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not like everybody should only do no prep or something like that. I I think there's a balance, but I think more my point is, is just sometimes, you know, Hey, look, we got, I got to put food on the table for my family. I've got this. If I get three hours to game this week, I don't have three hours to prep. Right. <laughs> like Exactly. No, you know, right. So and if I pull something off the shelf or if I just flip yep. through a monster book and I yep. say, Ooh, this is a cool one. I'm mm-hmm. running this monster. Yeah. Um, then, you know, that's enough of a hook yeah. uh, to get you started. Honestly, mm-hmm. the, People talk about game mastering as work sometimes, right? And there are paid GMs who do it professionally and really well. Mm -hmm. But uh, play is always sort of a deal between you and the players, right? If you're the only one carrying the story forward, it's like, man, find new players, right? Like They need to bring their heroic voice or their, I'm going to have a dramatic pause and give a little speech. And everyone groans, but sort of secretly is like, there goes the paladin. He's making the speech, <laughs> right? Like that's part of yeah. the entertainment too. Um, Cause it's a shared experience. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I, and, and I, I always regret that it took me a long time to realize that because uh, for some reason it took me a long time to realize that the, you know, three, four or five, six people sitting around the table with me are all incredibly creative people and they're right? ready to go. If I just say, oh, you want an island over there? What's on the island? And they're just like, it just pours forth, right? Like, <laughs> and you're just like, well, that's amazing. Let's go there. That sounds awesome. That sounds fantastic. You say there's an emerald mine? Uh, oh, but wow. also... <laughs> yeah. Also yes. a tower of an ancient wizard. I mean, it's like this stuff pours out and you're like, well, that's all good. That's better than I could have come up with. Right? So let's, let's go there. And I'll, I'll now make the emerald mine my own thing a little bit. I'll put a twist on it so you don't oh, know yeah. everything that's in it. Maybe but like, they're cursed. Hey, emeralds or mm-hmm. maybe there's the mine will eat you a lot uh, something yeah yes absolutely. yeah yeah and, no i took me a long time as well to sort of figure out that it wasn't all on my shoulders to be the entertainer yeah um and that well i i have learned to adore the players who show up and do dumb things mm-hmm. right like mm-hmm. there's a lever oh hooray i'm pulling the lever and i'm like Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a huge hole. I jump into it. You, right? You're just like, you like, didn't even look. What? The okay. less cautious players or the more exuberant players. Yeah. I, I used to punish them for like leaping into the fray foolishly. Yeah. And sometimes it's still a really dumb idea. Mm-hmm. But occasionally and more and more often, I think, as I see the game differently, it's like you leap into the fray, scattering the goblins in all directions. They're taken aback, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I want to reward people who are big, splashy, and fun. That's entertaining. If it were on a movie screen, it's the difference between, right, the guy who sort of slinks down the alleyway and does something quiet and sneaky and, hooray, our big, boisterous party is taking you down, dear gang lord. Yeah. So there are different ways of telling a story. No, absolutely. Absolutely. But um, I I do think that, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, it kind of becomes this thing where it's just like, well, the player just gets to show up with their character sheet, but the the game master, yeah. the dungeon master has had to spend, you know, 20 hours this week putting no, things no, no. together. <laughs> you know? I want to be able to say, oh, you want to go meet your mentor off the cuff at the start of the game session. Well, you hadn't mentioned it to me previously. Tell me about your mentor. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But who are they? Who? What are they? Do they have one eye? I'll, I'll, maybe right? I'll throw that one in. I'll, I'll, okay. They have one eye, but tell me who he, who he is or who she <laughs> right? is, is he a, we'll just go. is she a dwarf in the woods is she a hermit is she the <laughs> king is uh what, what's going on right yeah. like and if if it's their character and they're willing to kind of riff on it yeah they get the mentor they wanted maybe yeah yeah absolutely no I, i'm definitely for that and i think too sometimes i mean i don't know 
we're in the age, of course, of of expectations, right? The Matt Mercer effect. Everybody expects oh, yeah. the game master to be, you know, like him. And uh, but I always I always want to flip it around. I, I want the I want game masters and dungeon masters to have the like the Laura Bailey effect because I yes. want my players to be like awesome, engaged, and thinking of cool stuff like all the time, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean. I- a great game master, a great dungeon master can really elevate the game. There's no doubt, but Mm -hmm. without great players, you're just kind of, you know, you're throwing hooks and ideas and plot seeds into the wind and nothing's coming back because they're being, when they're super cautious and like, well, we're going to think about this for a while, or we poke at it with a stick for 20 minutes. I'm like, guys, it's a three hour game. You're burning 20 minutes on poking with a stick. I'm bored. Yeah, I, I poke the the sword through the door in case there's a trap or whatever. You know, right, those, like those people. Yeah, there there is that style of old school play where it's yeah. you against the world yeah. and the dungeon masters have to get you. But I find that less and less rewarding over time. It's a good introduction. Like, mm-hmm. okay, your char- How does your character act in a world if you don't understand role playing at all? Like, what can I do? Well, anything. Um, yeah. It's good to have a, a constrained environment like a dungeon or a small town. But at some point, you got to sort of say, all right, enough of that. We're going into, you know, the astral sea. We're, we're off into some weird alternate universe. We're on the plane of the elf folk. Mm-hmm. Well, what's that about? Yeah. We'll find out. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, yeah. We did kind of stop the story of your background a little bit. You so you oh, ended sure. up, you know, we ended up, you know, um, which I think was great. We were talking about some great stuff. I think it's very helpful for game masters. I think, um, I think if we can just relax and have fun, I think uh, if the players and the game master can just relax and have fun, we're we're in a we're in good shape. <laughs> in right, good shape. and I think if some of it's performance anxiety for both players yeah. and game masters. Yeah, but if you know, hey, it's my friends. These are people I'm comfortable with. You're you're in better shape. But yeah, I mean, I went from playing with my buddies to working professionally and trying to provide those published tools, mm-hmm. writing some Planescape, writing some al uh mm-hmm. working on a magic encyclopedia for second edition D&D. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah. I don't know, the last 16 years at Cobalt Press, right? So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, of course, yeah, you were at TSR and then which uh, was acquired by Wizards of the Coast. And yeah. so you began writing some of these things. I guess um, uh, I could ask you, you know, about, you know, preparing adventures, writing adventures for for game masters and dungeon masters, because obviously a lot of people who are listening either run published adventures or, you know, and then there's, of course, always a subset who want to write them and publish them yes. as well. Um, uh, I, I think encourage every, everyone to try writing one. Absolutely. Right? I, I do to- as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when you know you think of a good published adventure um now i'll give you my critique um uh well i always prefer usually always prefer running things that i make up because i'm just that uh-huh. kind of person you know i have yep. i had like i had like 30 campaign ideas while i was you know walking to the table to get lunch today right like i just yes. you know i mean i just have the ideas so i want to do some of that stuff but published adventures, I know for me, come in handy because usually the maps are great, stuff that I can't come up with on the fly. You know, there's ideas and situations that, you know, I would have never thought of just because, you know, I have a certain experience where somebody else, you know, worked on the thing for six months, you know, which is going to sure. be awesome, you know, or, you know, it's going to be great uh, because they spent a ton of time working on it and and that and and editors went over it and stuff. But my one critique is, is sometimes... I don't have time to read it all. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I, the bigger the adventure, the more intimidating it is just to yeah. wrap your brain about it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I don't know, this is where my time in at dungeon magazine kind of comes back to the fore. Mm-hmm. I always think that was a great training ga- ground for short and sweet, right? None of those adventures were more than, I don't know, 10 or 20 pages long tops. Mm-hmm. We just didn't have room to run a 60 page or 160 page adventure in a magazine. Mm-hmm. So I tend to think 
short stuff is great. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Drop-in adventures are great as prepared material because all you really need is enough for, you know, the Friday night game. Uh, you don't necessarily need six months of material in hardcovers right away. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of what I started doing over time is shorter and shorter stuff. And Cobalt Press does this too, right? Like we have layers. Uh, we call them layers, but I mean, they're basically one shots of 13 pages, 12 pages, 15 pages. Um, and maybe that's just my magazine roots showing, but they're pretty popular because you can drop them in anywhere and you don't have a lot to read. It's like, here's the setup. Here's the first couple obstacles. Here's the twist. And here's the finale done. Mm -hmm. And you can play it in four hours or eight hours. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, I the prep material, the more specific it gets, the harder it is for me to engage with it, right? Like mm -hmm. the other thing I see as successful in the tabletop space is material that's easy to adapt, right? Like you were saying, take some situations, take some characters out of it, plonk them into your homebrew because... I don't know if the numbers have changed any, at least back in the day. And I'm willing to bet today it's the same story. Like two thirds of all game masters are running their homebrew setting, the story they want to tell, mm -hmm. not the forgotten realms or, um, you know, take your pick of, of prepared settings. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm all for it, right? Like there's mm -hmm. so much room to support people who are, brewing up their own stories, creating adventures on the fly, um, or, or creating whole settings that are theirs and theirs alone. And they may never be published, but I don't think they've got to be for you to have a great time because it's your material. Mm -hmm. um, and no one can tell you you're doing it wrong because like, <laughs> yeah. it's my pirate kingdom in the South Pacific. Okay. And it works like this. Okay. And it's mine. I'm not arguing with you. You made it up, right? Like, yeah. um, and, and you can go as deep or as narrow as you want to. And like, there's a book called The Cobalt Guide to World Building that's still in print, like, I don't know, eight years after we first put it out. Mm -hmm. And it basically talks about just doing world building for the joy of it and how to do it and how to support a homebrew setting. And you know, questions to ask yourself if you're if you're inclined to make up your own campaign. Um, oh, it's it's hard homebrewing because it it basically means you are doing prep, but it's the kind of prep that's just sometimes daydreaming or sketching a map or or looking up monster stats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it doesn't feel like work to me ever. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I totally get that. Um, uh, and, th and that's kind of what I tell people too. It's just like, if it's, you know, if you're prepping for a game and that's like your leisure time, like you're having fun looking in books, yeah. then, then do that. Right. Because what's the difference of that between watching a TV show or a movie or something? You're having a blast, right? You're right. You're, you're looking, Ooh, look at this art or, yeah. Hey, I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to yeah. put some pictures together to hand out or show to players. Yeah. Right? And if prep feels like that, then that's awesome. Um, but if prep feels like, Oh my gosh, you know, I've got to carve this out. I'm up to midnight, you know, oh my God, I don't have time. I'm doing, if you're, if it's work, you know, then yeah. just, you know, I don't know. Drop that. Yeah. Drop or it, do, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. There's this weird thing, right? Like part of it's an anxiety of what if somebody asks me something I don't know the answer to Yeah. or, or I haven't read the full adventure and I know it's in there somewhere, but do I want to spend my time flipping around at the table? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Um, and I mean, sometimes it's easier to prepare just by reading a book cover to cover. Like, all right, here it is. This is a dungeon. I'm just reading the thing once and then I'm running it. Mm -hmm. um, and that can take literally less time than drawing all the maps and stocking the, the adventure yourself. Mm -hmm. But yeah, at some point you kind of have to trust yourself as the game yeah. master that yeah. like if the players are having a good time, you're doing it right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think too, I don't think um 
I don't know. I don't think players should expect Shakespeare from their dungeon master. You know, oh, um, it's nice if you get it. I mean, it's nice been, if you get it. I, I'm yeah, I'm not complaining. I've had there, some but. totally epically wonderful experiences, yeah. mm-hmm. but some of my play group perhaps is a little unfair because some of them, of yeah. course, were working professional game designers. Sure. <laughs> And you would hope that they're good at running a game. Yeah. Well, yeah. But some of the games I've done, I mean, convention games where I just drop in and play, some of those have been fantastic. And I have no idea who the person is running it. It's just like, well, I just met you. No, no, I I agree. But like, if you want me to be Shakespeare, then I expect you to be Michael Caine and Patrick Stewart. Absolutely. (laughs) Totally (laughs) fair. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and this. I mean, role playing games reward what you put into them. Yeah. Right? Like oh, they're a bottomless yeah. pit of if you want to prep forever, yeah. you can, but you'll never get to play. Yeah. And and if you show up kind of yeah. like, I'm just here to look at my phone and eat nachos, I'm like, yeah. well, why why not just do that at home and watch yeah. the game or something, right? Like yeah. um I, my my pet peeve is players who are not really engaged at all. Yeah. Everybody checks out once in a while. Everybody's mm-hmm. like, "Oh gosh, I wish you just finish your turn so I can do my thing." <laughs> but, yeah. um, but the people who are like, "Why are you here?" I, mm, yeah, I don't get it. Yeah. Um, now you did mention you said you know as obviously you publish you know adventures and you write adventures and things sure. like that. You had mentioned a little bit you you said you started saying like you were making it less specific because the majority yep. of people are making their own things, so they just need some material to kind of you know a situation to adapt into their into their current campaign world or whatever. So you know as a publisher or writer, how do you? How do you look to make those things less specific? Um, sure. So that they've oh, can... been doing that forever. And it is, it's an outgrowth of the fact that I used to get letters at Dungeon Magazine complaining when we would run a Forgotten Realms adventure. And the letter would say, you know, you wrote a, you published another Forgotten Realms adventure, but I'll have you know that I run Greyhawk <laughs> and I can't run your Realms adventures in my Greyhawk. Mm-hmm. And I would always scratch my head like, it said in a forest, there's a tower. I, I don't think this is going to be a hard port, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, we tried to make it, you know, okay, it is in Greyhawk and it's set, or it's in the realms and it's set here. But the moment we place it somewhere, like if you don't even give place names, step one, you're already ahead. Mm-hmm. And then the less cultural, whatever, uh, you know, rulers, societies like if you start stripping away the the, all the aspects of civilization and all you're left with is monsters (laughs) as plot (laughs) elements then it's perfect the only problem is now there's no reason to care right because there's no villagers to rescue or whatever i i wrote something recently so uh, not that recent i wrote something a few years ago called the raven's call which is Mm -hmm. basically meant to be dropped into any campaign and the trick it pulls is there's one village there are raiders who have taken over the village. The village is anywhere along a sea coast, and the hook is you're walking down the road and you see a pillar of smoke up ahead. Much too much smoke to be a campfire, right? Yeah. And it's like, oh, the raiders have burnt the roof off this, and they've captured all the sheep, and grandma's in the barn with all these prisoners, and the raiders are here. And how you go about rescuing them every time i run it it's something different right Mm -hmm. different groups say frontal assault or sneak in by night and free the sheep and you know rescue grandma by carrying her out on barbarian's back Mm -hmm. um all those things but it doesn't have connections to a wider world um and cobalt press has been doing that style a lot more because we have a campaign setting, but even when we started with the Midgard campaign setting, and that was 10 years ago now, we said, we're going to make it easy to strip for parts, Mm -hmm. right? Like the forest is a forest and it's interesting, but you could drop this forest somewhere else. 
The trouble is, the more you write about a setting, the more people want the answers to, well, why and what's yeah. over that hill? And how does this person relate to that? And this says he's on the city council, but over here it says he's not important. What do you mean? Right. And mm -hmm. you start to have a discussion and the world building starts to gather steam. Mm -hmm. So doing small, short pieces uh, and sort of snipping off the threads that would otherwise bind it together into a wider world. It makes it really playable for people who are like, this is a great adventure. I like this little thing. We're just going to have the pillar of smoke and rescue the village. And that'll be Friday night. Mm -hmm. um, and you can run it like a Viking epic, or you can run it like the seven samurai, or you can run it like, I don't know, a heist movie. Um, but it's, it's a situation and a, a beautiful map and a few fun NPCs at its heart. Yeah. No, I think that's that's really good. Um, also, there's there's one other thing too. When um, running, when I run a, something that's published, there always seems to be some piece of information or backstory that is really neat or really yes. interesting. But I can't. There is no way I can give it to my players without saying like, "You're in a dream," or <laughs> you know, right. in a dream you see. That, well, I've uh, seen different yeah. solutions, right? Like yeah. in a dream is, it's not yeah. the worst thing, no, especially no, if yeah. you've got a character who's already prophetic and into dreams. But yes, that works great. Yes, <laughs> it works great. But like, I've generally told game designers, like the background that starts four thousand years ago is usually not of interest, and the only stuff that you really need in an adventure is stuff that is still relevant in the present day. If the lich is 4,000 years old and still alive, great, it matters. Mm -hmm. If the tomb was built 4,000 years ago and no one remembers who built it, not that important, right? Mm -hmm. um, so cutting background down to half of what a writer turns over is something I did as an editor time after time after time. Mm -hmm. um, because the setup, the current day, what do the players see? That's the lived experience. Anything that the players don't see might still be valuable context for the game master, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I wouldn't throw it all away. Mm -hmm. It was like, well, the Lich is important, this, this, and this, but the Lich is dead now, and here's his cousin Vinny, who's in charge of the dungeon. Well, that's hilarious, right? Like, oh my god, cousin Vinny is the Lich's <laughs> descendant and in charge of the dungeon? Yeah, nothing in the dungeon will harm cousin Vinny. Okay, well, it's important to know there was a Lich, but right now, what the players see is cousin Vinny, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah context can set you up um but all of the world building saga lore stuff like the bard cares and the wizard cares maybe mm -hmm. um but most of the players at the table care more about is the door locked is that <laughs> waterfall one we can leap off and live how bad is the fire trap oh the other trick for hiding backstory cleverly of course is the skyrim solution and the Call of Cthulhu solution, which is handouts, a.k.a. books full of lore that those who are interested can read. <laughs> right? Like if you type yeah. out that little bit of lore that you really want to share with people and you say, a scroll of the history of the Second Empire, and you condense it down to 150 words, it's like, well, there's the Second Empire. Anybody who cares can read it. Mm -hmm. And the rogue can say, is it worth anything? <laughs> yes because <laughs> that's the present day reality yeah like, and the barbarian wonders if they can eat it or hit it with their axe yes. right can i learn to read it is it magic no no it's a history <laughs> yes. right so i don't know i love putting in levers buttons handouts stuff you interact with in mm -hmm. character mm -hmm. because that makes the adventure rich I love giving monsters names because that means you can talk to them or introduce them like anything that's current, present, visible, sensory. That's great stuff. That's what a game master and the players feed off of to get uh, more enjoyment out of the game. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, why don't you... Um... Why don't you tell us a little about Cobalt Press? If there's somebody out there who's not familiar with it, and then maybe sure. tell us a little about maybe Midgard as well. 
Sure. Uh, Cobalt Press is the tabletop game company I founded about 16 years ago now. Um, it's always been a third-party uh, D&D and Pathfinder company, uh, and it's always been leaning heavily on homebrewers. Uh, we publish monster books. I, this week, we're releasing Tome of Beasts 3, uh, our, our latest monster manual of 5th edition D&D monsters. Um, we we publish things like Deep Magic, Tomes Full of Spells for every spellcasting class, and the Cobalt Guides to things like Cobalt Guide to World Building, Cobalt Guide to Game Design, Cobalt Guide to Board Game Design, Cobalt Guide to Magic. Oh, gosh, there's a bunch. Uh, <laughs> Cobalt Guide to Monsters. Um, and those are really just tools for homebrewers. And the whole point of Cobalt Press since the beginning has been let's publish great adventures and let's make them tools for homebrewers. And Midgard is actually six years younger than the company. Eventually, people said, you've got all these great adventures and they all seem to take place in an implied setting. And I'm like, darn it, they're wise to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's my old campaign. And I've kind of dressed it up here because we needed a name for the city where the city adventure happens. <sighs> Um, and it was never supposed to really get that big until one day I said, what if we just did a campaign setting book? Um, and in 2012, we published the Midgard campaign setting, um, which has been going ever since. Mm -hmm. And it is not the biggest thing we publish. Like we, we have things called like campaign builder cities and towns, which is all about homebrewing your own cities and towns right mm -hmm. um or or oh book of ebon tides which is like a guide to the plane of shadows and the fey elves who live there and it's like if you want to put a shadow plane in your campaign do it or going back to our earlier conversation we have a thing called vault of magic which is a collection <laughs> of magical items <laughs> did you do um, that one yourself i wrote a couple of <laughs> items in there uh but i did not do the whole thing i actually got people to write it who are uh awesome uh patrick rothfuss actually wrote us a magic oh. item in that one okay uh wow. deborah yeah. ann wall uh, he's the author of name of the wind uh for those who yes don't know. Yeah. he totally did uh luke gygax of course gary gygax's son wrote mm -hmm. one um oh gosh uh mike shea better known as sly flourish online wrote one yep lazy dungeon master i've interviewed him on the podcast yeah right uh gail simone wrote us a piece mm. she's a comics writer deborah ann wall anyway uh a ton of fun items by people you might or might not know um uh, and uh, you know just table after table to roll on and then of course we got clever the, the tables of magic items in Vault of Magic uh, at the back of the book also list the items from the Dungeon Master's Guide. So you only need to roll on one table. Oh, there you go. And it could be a Vault of Magic item you get, or it could be one you're already familiar with from, uh, from the Dungeon Master's Guide. But yeah, that one is sort of coming full circle, if you will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we did collect items from... Uh, from previously published Cobalt Press books, because we're like, we have done hundreds. Surely we have enough to fill a book. <laughs> and uh, and that was fun, too. But I did not do that. This time. I did not do the collecting part. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's good. And so. Um, uh, so Cobalt Press in Midgard, I guess it sounds like that kind of, you know, kind of took on a life of its own then once you, you oh published yeah. It? yeah once we published it um and we've had a patreon for years that uh that provides support for it we've published many adventures for it it's sort of our default setting if we like well we need to put it somewhere well put it in midgard uh we publish plenty of more generic adventures but midgard offers us like you know characters and hooks and people keep asking us so what about the dragon empire or what's going on in that mysterious forest uh and we do have a midgard book coming out in january um which goes back to the very origins of the setting it's called zobek the clockwork city which was meant to be initially this sort of river town trade town that you could plop into your own homebrew mm -hmm. uh but in the way of many fantasy cities from lankmar to Waterdeep to greyhawk right it mm -hmm. 
kind of took on a life of its own. And then people said, well, what is down the river? And before you knew it, it was connected to other things, which was probably a terrible mistake. But uh, <laughs> the Sobek, the Clockwork City, is in fact uh, it's really just still a drop-in setting full of characters and I think a dozen adventures in the back mm-hmm. uh, from like level one to eight. So it's a full city book and a whole bunch of urban adventuring, which uh, which makes me pretty happy. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, no, it's sort of the version of the book. We've published Zobek City books before for Midgard. Um, but this one's in hardcover. And <laughs> the original one in 2012 is like black and white and, you know, 60 pages long. No adventures. Yeah. Um, things have changed in 10 years. Wow. Yeah. Um, I guess... Uh... I should ask then, what does the future hold? What uh, do you have coming down the pipeline at Cobalt Press? Well, Cobalt Press has always got a lot of projects brewing. Um, We just did a a nice Kickstarter about sort of chaos magic, chaos wastelands. That'll ship uh, in summer of 2023 called Wastes of Chaos and Tales from the Wastes. Um, But right now... uh, Tomo Beast 3 and Tomo Beast 3 Lairs is what we're releasing for uh, for December, for the holidays. Um, and our monster books have always been among our most popular releases because, of course, they're usable anywhere. Mm-hmm. And they're heavily playtested and beautifully illustrated. Um, but we're probably not going back to do another monster book right now. <laughs> um, we've done a bunch of them. Uh, we'll probably lean on something else, some tools for homebrewers, maybe another cobalt guide in the springtime. Uh, we're going to keep publishing small adventures like the prepared series, uh, which are all one map adventures. Um, I think cobalt press is in a pretty good position right now. Like we, we kind of have it down We're we're even branching out and, you know, making some dice, uh, making uh we had a huge turnout at gen con for our organized play we ran like a hundred and something tables worth of games at gen con oh wow yeah um turns out organizing an event that size is a whole lot of work but (laughs) um but the team put it together and we hope to do that at gen con at 23 as well so we're going to keep on going uh with fifth edition support or dnd support generally i should say and with homebrew support that's less rule specific uh, and things like the Cobalt Guides, uh, we're also doing maps. You mentioned maps as a useful resource earlier. Absolutely. And we're doing things called map folios these days, which are oh. like two foot by three foot full color wet dry erase battle maps. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, they're beautiful. The yeah. first one we did was for a, actually was for a dungeon adventure called the Scarlet Citadel been run on a ton of streams it's just a great old school like there's a story in there and there's mysteries and things to uncover but it's also a dungeon crawl right Mm -hmm. um and the maps are just stunning there's like a dozen maps and then there's these overlay cards like when the room changes or you discover the secret room like you can put this overlay card on and it's right there on the table um and then we're doing we're doing another map folio, I think, for Tales from the Wastes. No, for cities and towns, for the campaign building piece. Mm-hmm. So a bunch of neat city maps. And I think we're going to keep doing that. We have a couple of cartographers who are just stunning and putting their work in physical form and and just spread it out and, and draw on it is pretty great. So more of that would make me happy. I sometimes... <laughs> We do stuff just because it seems like a useful tool for our games, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. For Cobalt staffers. Uh-huh. Not always. Sometimes we're like, no, this is useful for things beyond just our internal house games. Um, <laughs> or we want to do this bit of world building over here. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, we're going to keep experimenting. We've always been sort of a small but fierce company um, that occasionally we get burned trying something new but more often than not like you know there's enough cobalts we take a few casualties but we just keep coming (laughs) nice yeah (laughs) we don't quit (laughs) you don't quit (laughs) yeah 
yeah, us and our pack tactics. No, we're we're yeah. a good bunch. Um, and we'll be at uh, Pax Unplugged, um, okay. the big game show in Philadelphia in December, mm-hmm. the first week of December. There's going to be a bunch of Cobalt Press people there. Um, and yeah, it's always nice to see people in person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I have to say about eight months ago or so, I got to play a cobalt thief in a couple of Woo-hoo. sessions and it was the craziest thing ever. <laughs> um, uh, oh my gosh. It was, it was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. Good. I love <laughs> taking characters like that. Uh, yeah. The, the cobalt, the goblin, the, uh, you know, he's not tough, but he doesn't need to be he's just oh, going to no. sneak around. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I use that one ability. What is it? The grovel, beg, and plead ability. And yes. <laughs> nobody, none of the other players or the DM had ever heard of that ability, and they were all blown away by it. And I was just like, yep, <laughs> I just gave everybody advantage. Go for it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> team support, right? Like yeah, Cobalt's absolutely. teamwork. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, right. that's good. I mean, yeah we're really in it because we want people's games to be better. Yeah. Right. Like Mm -hmm. that's kind of it for Cobalt press. We're never going to be able to compete with the big guns like wizards of the coast. Um, But we are a big enough group and Kickstarter has made it possible to fund some just beautiful looking books and we can get some amazing designers. And the other thing we just keep doing is we play test the heck out of stuff like that. Tomo beast three monster manual piece we've got coming. There are, 700 playtesters on that book oh wow yeah and yeah. they gave us well they just made it a better book right like mm-hmm. <laughs> every single time that came back so we're big believers in what works at the table mm-hmm. yeah um because it's fun to do theory crafting design and it's like well it looks like it ought to be like this um but then when you actually try it out sometimes you're right on and sometimes uh, the reality is you have misjudged. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, no, absolutely. Where can uh, people find all of these great works? Oh, well, cobaltpress.com is, of course, the most obvious place. We also put up a bunch of blog stuff there, like, I don't know, four days a week, free monsters, spells, uh, game advice. We put up a series of spell jammer like themed spacefaring uh creatures a new race all of that stuff is up there um almost every weekday at cobaltpress.com on the blog uh you can also find us on twitter as long as twitter's around that's at cobalt press um there's a secret site on facebook or a facebook group called jiro's official cobalt press page or group and then there's a more traditional facebook dot com slash cobalt press one oh i'm forgetting something we're probably on instagram yes we are i know we are mm-hmm. and and oh if you want to follow me on twitter uh my twitter handle is monkey king so that's a few places to find us i'm sure i've forgotten something and the social media cobalt will come after me later <laughs> YouTube. I don't think you mentioned YouTube. Ah, yes. We have a Twitch <laughs> channel in YouTube. Oh, oh there you go. God, the Twitch channel has Cobalt Chats every Wednesday at noon Pacific. And the YouTube is where we store all the good stuff. And oh my goodness, there's a Tales from the Wasted West series. There's uh, the Cobalt Chats. There's various, oh my gosh, uh, playthroughs. There's one called Mimic Madness was a one-shot actual play where everybody played a different mimic. that was the halloween special and it's hilarious just pick one pick that one uh there's a hour-long interview with deborah ann wall about vault of magic on our youtube channel Uh, it's a deep well go take a look youtube slash cobalt press i think (laughs) all right and i will be sure to include uh some of those links in the show notes at dicegeeks.com so anybody who is listening right now can head over there and check out the show notes for this episode and uh head off to uh cobalt press or to their youtube channel or whatever well wolfgang it was an absolute pleasure uh being able to speak with you uh thank you so much for coming on today oh thank you i had a wonderful time um Let's do it again. All right. There you have it, guys. I really hope you enjoyed my conversation with Wolfgang today. 
Please, please be sure to check out the show notes at DiceGeeks.com to find out what Cobalt Press is up to. Amazing, amazing role-playing game, supplements, books, all of that. Please check out the show notes again at DiceGeeks.com. All right. If you want some free stuff, you can also go over to DiceGeeks.com, but you're going to put a slash and a free right behind uh, the dot com there, and you will get some free resources and a weekly email update from me letting you know what is going on here in the wild, wild world of Dice Geeks. Also, if you would like to support the show, please like, rate, review, and subscribe. Also, uh, you can check out the Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Dice Geeks to support the show financially. That would be amazing. All right, now I thank you so much for listening, and until next time, keep gaming!